and uh, the, the, your mic is also live. So perfect. Thanks there. a lot. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have your uh, presentation yeah, set that's up right. where you left it last time. Perfect. Fantastic. That's exactly. I don't need them. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Simone Cavallaro, and I'm the director of the Stigler Center at Chicago Booth. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, back Robert, Roberto Di Castro for the second day. It's not working? OK. Uh, for the second part of the Stigler Center mini course on fintech and banking in Europe. Uh, yesterday, Roberto spoke on uh, how fintech is tra transforming retail financial services in Europe. Today, we look forward um, uh, to hearing from him on European banks' reaction on, to fintech. Please note that we are on the record and we are uh, live streaming, so please silence your phones. Uh, as always, I'd like to remind that the views uh, uh, expressed by individuals we host are their own, uh, not those of the Stiegel Center of the, University of, of the University of Chicago. As you may know, the Stiegel Center promotes and diffuses research on regulatory capture um, the, and the distortion that special interest groups impose on capitalism. We have many initiatives, so please check our website for full details. Uh, there are a couple of... Um, particular um, uh, initiative that I'd like to highlight. Uh, at the beginning of January, we released a new podcast, Capital Isn't, hosted by Stigler faculty director um, Luigi Zingales and uh, Kate Waldock from Georgetown University. Uh, the podcast is on uh, what works and what doesn't in capitalism today. Uh, today we released the seventh episode entitled The Moral Case Against the MBA. Uh, with our first uh, guest, Duff McDonald, um, who is also the writer of The Golden Passport. Also on February 26, at lunchtime, uh, we will host Sharon Bowen, former uh, uh, CFTC commissioner, for a conversation with Booth Professor Guy, Guy Rolnick on financial regulation and beyond. If you are interested in attending this event but haven't registered yet, please do so on our website. Before we begin, please allow me to in briefly introduce our guest again. Roberto Nicastro is an Italian businessman and banker. He has served as chairman of Casa del Trentino, the A-rated Italian financial company, since 2015. He is also an angel investor in several fintech startups. From 2015 to 2017, he served as chairman of the four good banks entrusted by Bank of Italy to restructure and sell them. From 2010 to 2015, he served as Unicredit's general manager. Previously, he served in various capacity, capacities at Unicredit and before, and before that at McKinsey and Salomon Brothers. Please join me in welcoming Roberto Nicastro. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, good morning. I think that uh, with some of you, uh, uh, we had a chance to, to, to talk and discuss uh, yesterday. Some, I can also see some new faces, I think. So um, today's uh, focus is uh, uh, moving from uh, the transformation that FinTech uh, is bringing to the entire financial services landscape in Europe to the actual impact on banks uh, and uh, to what banks could try and do in order to react to this kind of uh, hurricane that... Uh, is, or slow hurricane, I would call it, that is uh, sweeping uh, the financial services industry in, uh, with a lot of implications that are a bit difficult also for banks to fully capture and incorporate in their strategy. And so, uh, today's focus is really how banks uh, are reacting to fintech. Um, I already showed yesterday this, uh, this slide, I just uh, uh, can be a useful reminder, just to say uh, that uh, what is fintech, I recall fintech is this really uh, a revolution of financial services with that potentially can unbundle and uh, uh, transform all uh, uh, banking business models uh, uh, because of technology, because of customer expectation, because of regulatory development, and in a context in which up to now 
uh, changes have been really already radical and major when it comes to payments have been significant uh, uh, initial on lending, uh, while up to now we haven't seen so much when it comes to uh, uh, wealth management. Now, uh, having in mind uh, uh, this, this background, so now uh, the question is, uh, uh, what can happen uh, uh, in a context in which you have, on one side, uh, banks with uh, millions of customers, uh, customers that tend to be quite sticky, they, move, uh, they don't move so much from one bank to the other or from bank to a fintech. Uh, on the other end, uh, the innovation uh, in the technology in production that is uh, very much something driven and pushed uh, by fintech. Uh, 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 what can do banks? What is the challenge that is presented to them? What kind of strategies they can try and employ uh, to react to it? And I anticipate to you that it is not an easy answer. It is not even an happy ending in a sense that in this moment uh, it's completely unclear uh, uh, what will happen. Uh, somebody says that banks are like dinosaurs, so they will be really wiped out and distincted by this. Somebody else is thinking that in reality there can be some cooperation with fintech that may change the things, and somebody else also in banking says that in reality fintech is an interesting phenomenon, but that's not going to change much in the financial services landscape. So uh, I hope that as a result of the today's discussion we'll have better ideas on uh, uh, the future developments. Now, uh, um, what are the main implications uh, in terms of problems uh, for banks uh, arising from the fintech revolution? Well, uh, uh, first of all, in most areas, uh, uh, fintech is bringing clearly much more power to the consumer, and power to the consumer, we said yesterday, uh, tends to bring also an erosion of margin. That is completely clear when it comes to payments. Uh, uh, the average fees for any payment that banks uh, uh, were charging uh, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 20 years ago, was a big multiple of what they can charge now, or what is now charged to consumers in this activity. And this trend is just continuing. So there you have very, very clearly, uh, and remember that in, in, uh, in retail banking, for instance, payments uh, tended to uh, uh, represent, to account for almost uh, 20 to 30 percent of revenues. Um, uh, second other problem and implication is that uh, uh, fintechs uh, tend to cherry pick their customer. Once you, do, uh, start, uh, you start from scratch, uh, uh, why going for uh, the uh, not so attractive businesses and customers? You go for where there is uh, the meat, where there is uh, 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 substance. And uh, this is a big problem for banks. Why? Because in reality, banks uh, are these uh, uh, um, uh, large, uh, 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 huge companies that in reality do live, have been living uh, uh, with many, many cross subsidies. They serve both customers, they make a lot of money, and then they also serve customers like uh, 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 the uh, old uh, uh, ladies uh, working and living in some kind of a small village where typically just serving air is much more expensive than whichever revenue you can get from them. Clearly, uh, fintech are not going for this customer. They tend to go for, for where there is uh, money to be made. Uh, um, and that's clearly a significant issue. I would add also uh, uh, another couple of problems to this one. Um, another problem uh, is the fact that uh, in the past, at least, uh, banks were, the, in a way, the, uh, had the monopoly of trust. By definition, if you were a customer and you wanted to have somebody to whom uh, to give your money, the bank would be trust, capital T trust uh, actor. After the crisis, uh, uh, after a lot of also reputational problems, that has, come in, uh, that has come down. One could argue that, uh, on the opposite, internet players uh, uh, have uh, instead uh, generated a lot and not always uh, completely deserved uh, sympathy with uh, uh, consumers and with individuals. So this kind of uh, trust barrier that existed in the past uh, is uh, uh, coming down. Another issue, also related to the partially to the cross subsidy, but not, 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 that's not the only case, is the issue of uh, uh, managing uh, uh, so-called price contamination between online and offline customers. Uh, in theory, by reacting to fintech, by being uh, you know, aggressive on digital, you can say, fine, if you just buy the service completely self-service, you pay me almost nothing, no? like an internet company, fine, that you can do, but then you have the customer who's coming offline and he doesn't necessarily accept the idea that another customer for the same service, just because it's physically uh, delivered, has to pay much more. So the cannibalization problem in the digital development is a very big issue for, for, for banks. So uh, FinTech clearly is bringing uh, a number of problems. 
There are also opportunities, as always. <laughs> I'm sure you will expect this type of slide. Um, <clears throat> first opportunity is cost reduction. Uh, uh, technology is, uh, in the, in the, what FinTech are doing, is a major, major opportunity for banks to leverage on it to reduce their cost basis. Uh, it can be a matter of simple automation, uh, just like in other sectors. It can be the potential that artificial intelligence, chatbots, and so on, uh, machine learning, can bring to the, um, uh, to the, to the banking activities. Uh, up to recent times, uh, one could think that the only, uh, or the activities that were easy to automate were, would have been uh, the activities that typically performed the branch uh, uh, and connected with payments. The more uh, you go ahead and the more you see that uh, um, you might potentially imagine in the future even a, a, a real uh, uh, robot that is performing advising type of services. We are still very far away from that. But frankly, a lot of uh, development that happened uh, in the recent time uh, are clearly going in this direction and are uh, potentially giving uh, huge opportunities to reduce the costs for banks. Um, yesterday, we had some talks about RegTech, the uh, branch of FinTech that aims to uh, make uh, the regulatory compliance uh, uh, cheaper, more effective, more precise, more customer friendly. That's another area that can give a very high potential for banks to reduce costs uh, through FinTech. And generally speaking, we discuss that a bit later because I think it's relevant. The IT cost that still account for a retail bank approximately for, I'd say, 20-25% of cost uh, could be really reduced uh, in a major way. Uh, could banks, uh, and that's not obvious how, uh, uh, truly and fully leverage on the benefits that new technologies provide, especially when it comes to the entire IT machine, the so-called core banking system. And uh, I, I'll, I'll be touching some, and spending some time on it uh, later on. Then uh, uh, it is an opportunity to increase revenues. Just think about the usage of data. Um, in the past, banks were seen as the main users of data on customers. Then in the last 20 years, a big internet revolution came, uh, and right now, what you have is a situation where the sophistication that uh, a Facebook, a Google, and Amazon has in managing data is uh, uh, another order of magnitude compared to the sophist sophistication that typically banks have. Having said this, uh, uh, it means that there is a lot of potential. Banks have tons of data on us, uh, and uh, by uh, employing, for instance, big data technology, uh, they could be much better into identifying the next product opportunities, so the cross-selling on customers, uh, to arrive to really a, a, a pricing sophistication to be capable to capture almost customer by customer what is your precise price elasticity and price you exactly at that level, something that in the past was impossible. Or uh, you can reduce churn, you can more easily predict which customers are almost ready to go and so try to stop them and, and see what's the problem and so on and so forth. Or uh, um, improve the risk management uh, by uh, much better and higher data sourcing. Opportunities comes clearly in the service upgrade. Uh, you can definitely improve a lot the type of services that, that is given. One example is, uh, yesterday we discussed at some point of robo-advice, um, and uh, uh, while robo-advice uh, seen as a B2C service, so something employed directly towards customers, is still growing at very, very, very little uh, growth rates. Uh, you can see that the potential of employing a form of automation of the wealth management activity uh, within the bank is such that for those banks that can be successful, they could be uh, in a position to offer a quasi-private banking type of service even to mass market customers. So uh, um, also there, uh, uh, there's a big potential. Another, let's say, opportunity or defense, let me say, is instead the retail customer's stickiness. Uh, the fact that, uh, again, I was saying this before, uh, customers uh, um, are not so prone to change bank. I was seeing the other day a, a statistics. Uh, I'm not sure if it was true or not. Uh, as always, it was a bit uh, provocative. I was saying that in the UK, uh, there are more people who divorced uh, no, from their partner than people who divorced from their bank. Uh, I, think, I don't think it's true, but effectively it tells you a lot uh, on the fact that people long-term relationships tend to sticky for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, uh, 
We talked about uh, uh, um, problems, opportunities. Let's also look at some constraints. Constraints towards uh, um, major, please. Uh, I'm wondering, would you want to, is it better to do questions now at the end? I'm happy to, 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 do, to open the floor now. Please, go ahead. At the end? So, just keep it, so it'll be the first. Thanks. Um, let's talk about uh, some, uh, some, some constraints, uh, especially constraints towards the drive and the desire to, let's say, change uh, completely the business model as a result of fintech, uh, because there are pretty big constraints. The first one is the constraint of legacies. Uh, well, as a bank, you sit on uh, pretty, st pretty strong, robust structures uh, that are difficult to change and are not necessarily you want to get rid uh, uh, immediately or, or, or quickly. Uh, think about networks, no? the branch networks. Uh, they exist, they do perform a service, we'll speak in a second about it. Um, clearly, uh, uh, FinTech and Cost Drive and so on uh, would bring you to thinking that you should uh, get rid of those uh, or that you should do only but uh, uh, finding the right uh, uh, compromise uh, is not easy because lots of valuable activities do still happen in branches. Um, and uh, uh, or uh, a, a crucial aspect is the one that regards uh, core banking system. Core banking system is the backbone, the IT backbone on which the bank is based. Um, and uh, uh, if you look at the top 50 world banks, you tend to see something quite similar. It is quite striking that uh, uh, the picture is very similar because these core banking systems are systems that were built in the, they were started to be built in the 60s. Uh, and still some pieces of that uh, are uh, built and uh, maintained with 1960s technology. Uh, uh, who has ever heard uh, the word COBOL? Okay. So, so it's old, but not so old, and, uh, and uh, some of you know it. Fine. It is a language that uh, if you talk to any uh, IT developer uh, would think about COBOL, just something coming from the Egyptian times. No? Uh, in fact, uh, there are still in banks uh, people who know COBOL, and uh, without those people, you could not do changes to the IT banking system because certain pieces are made in COBOL and cannot be changed alone. So you have a stratification. Uh, you a system that was born on products and not on customer, so you have the piece that is in charge of, uh, uh, let's say, securities, the piece that is in charge of uh, current accounts, the piece that is in charge of credit, and uh, uh, to extract data, you must create uh, uh, what people like to call a spaghetti uh, 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 infrastructure with data that move from one part to the other. Uh, 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 to provide ultimately the type of uh, either need you might have in risk management, in customer management, and so on and so forth. Um, so as you can imagine, this stuff is extremely expensive to run. Whenever you want to do a development for a new regulation to offer a service, oh, it's a long project. No, it's a one-year project. Uh, lots of people coming, zillions of consultants, enormous uh, uh, capacity absorption, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, uh, 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 in this context, uh, uh, we'll discuss afterwards, I think it's part of, part of the solution, uh, not easy to really uh, change it. It's not a the fact that almost all of the top 50 world banks still have this type of system tells you something, in a sense that bankers are not so stupid. Now, we are stupid, but not so stupid. If you couldn't be easy to change, you would have changed it already. But we haven't. So there are some reasons for that. Um, so uh, there is a culture is a legacy. Just think about the typical differences in terms of competence and so on you can find uh, within uh, a, a, a large internet company in the typical bank. Uh, uh, and think about how many people do work in a bank. So the cultural gap uh, uh, to, to, to move to fintech and to change is large. And then you have quarterly results. Quarterly results uh, is also another issue because um, as we discussed, uh, and uh, if you remember the first slide I showed yesterday, it was a slide talking about the progressive revolution, steady but slowly and progressive revolution of fintech. It means that it doesn't change things in six months. No? So if uh, the market is monitoring you on what you do in terms of results in the next three months, doing very large investment and risk investments to change uh, how you're going to be in five years' time, uh, well, uh, not necessarily something that the market appreciates. No? 
uh, you do it, you think it's important, but on the other end, the people and the market will tell you, okay, fine, I don't care about it, but what do you do in the next quarter? Well, the revenue is coming, where's the cost cutting? So, uh, the trade-off between uh, changing and investing for the future and delivering short-term results without those uh, the CEO goes is uh, particularly complicated when it comes to transforming uh, uh, the banking business towards uh, digital. And we have the organizational silos. Um, again, uh, these companies were not, uh, these banks were not built in the time of uh, uh, agile, of scrum, uh, of teamwork. We're built in big silos. You have the net, the people in the charge in the network. You have the person that is in charge of uh, uh, multi-channel and digital, the person that is in charge of marketing. No? And in a context in which all of them have to deliver short-term results, putting them together to work smoothly for a long-term project is difficult. Uh, it's very difficult. So, uh, uh, there are quite a lot of, of constraints. And uh, to uh, 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 finalize uh, a kind of diagnostic of uh, position of banks versus uh, 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 digital, let me talk a moment about the role of the branch. Because we, that, that, how, many, how often do you, what is the last time you went to a bank branch? Or how many times, please? Six months ago, okay, and so you would go once a year, twice a year, more or less. Does anybody here go more than, please? Ten times a year? Ten years ago, ten years ago, okay, in fact, that doesn't surprise me. Ten years ago, absolutely. Somebody else has gone more than five times to the branch in the last one year? Nobody? More than three times? More than one time? Okay, so probably the average is around two times, or 1.5, okay. Now, uh, uh, obviously, you saw a special segment. No, you're not the average user. Um, now, if you look at uh, how uh, uh, the branch is uh, still used, what you see is that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, yes, uh, uh, branch visits have been deeply dropping, while there have been an explosion of the other touch points, no? be it uh, 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 internet, uh, smartphone, uh, call center, you name it. And uh, 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 clearly, there is an ongoing drive to reduce networks and change formats. But on the other hand, uh, uh, everybody has to be aware that the banks is not dead. Sorry, the branch is not dead yet. Still, lots of things happen in the branch. Which ones? Well, uh, you might be surprised to hear that the vast majority of the selling activity is performed in the branch. Uh, maybe sometimes it's even made on the phone by somebody that sits in physically in the branch. But uh, uh, there are uh, uh, very, very, very few banks in the world uh, where more than 20% uh, of, the of the selling activity is digital. 80% uh, uh, tends to be performed through the branch or maximum through contact center. You still have some paper back office activity happening in the branch. You have, and this is very important, a lot of value-added advisory services. So, uh, when uh, one is a moment in which uh, uh, you start to have some nice money and you think what to do next, uh, yes, you can do everything self-service, you can try and do the chat, uh, maybe you can do over the phone, but let's face it, it's like going to a doctor. You prefer the first time to be in person. It's also a matter of, uh, it's a complex transaction, a lot of, you want to put a lot of questions in that type of context, you want to see somebody you can trust. Uh, so, uh, uh, we might like it or not, but there is part of banking activities, the ones that are you know, complex transactions, where the physical one-to-one -one person uh, is important. No? Uh, 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 it's not like getting in love, but again, uh, uh, you cannot have a, a virtual love relationship going for too long. No? There are also aspects that require, um, uh, let's say, the, the, the human touch, we call it this way. You can have uh, troubleshooting elements where effectively, uh, uh, again, uh, when there is something complex to manage, it's better to be there in person. You can have cash intensive services, retailers, that's where, uh, uh, okay, credit card uh, uh, is widely used, uh, but still a lot of cash going around in the economy, there are checks and so on, and so a retailer maybe has to come once a day to deposit the cash uh, it has uh, uh, got uh, in that day of business. Then you have uh, uh, older customers, uh, not yet used uh, to new technology. You can have uh, digital illiterate customers. Again, uh, uh, we are not uh, the right sample no, from this standpoint, but the world uh, is, not, is not us just. Uh, and you have branch lovers. <laughs> you have uh, the, uh, almost any banks is that 5 to 10% of customers do like to go to the branch, believe it or not. 
Uh, maybe it's also a social moment, or it's an habit, or whatever, but there are people who, they like to go to the branch. I have to tell you, by the way, that in southern Italy, uh, 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 bank branches, uh, at some point, uh, had really become like a social point, a social uh, uh, place for, for, for networking, connection, and so on and so forth. So, um, that's a bit of uh, an anecdote, but the fact is that you can see, and sorry, I'm forgetting, but really, last but not least, new customer acquisition very, very often needs to have a physical moment for the onboarding, for the signature, for the first time uh, contact, for the trust you require in the moment in which you open up a, a, a relationship. So most of the new customer acquisition is passing through the branch. So you're a bank that you have seen all this internet and uh, uh, fintech revolution happening in front of you. Uh, you have a lot of legacies that are made in a way and not of them useless. So it's not just a matter of saying, oh, okay, I do. I do this, I take out, I do something different. Um, uh, you have the market that don't seem really to care much about what you do in order to transform digitally. So what would you do? What are the options available? Uh, and now is a question really to you. So before entering into potential areas of solution, I would like to understand if you were the CEO of a bank that has this situation of fintech revolution, your assets, you have all the customers, you know that these guys outside of the, the FinTech guys are not so effective in getting new customers because it's expensive for them, but they have a much better technology. Uh, uh, the branch is not dead yet. What would you do? What uh, would be the strategies available to you? Please. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's one of the solutions, you're right. Other ideas? Please. Yes, it's, so it's, uh, uh, it's in the, in the uh, same area of, of venture capital. It may be virtual, it may be incubator, but that's the direction. So put a foot in this new world that is coming. Other ideas, please? Yes, absolutely. So do R&D, please. Yeah, thanks, absolutely. Partnering is another venue. More ideas? Yeah, well, I didn't expect them to ask. Yes? Yes, lobby heavily to start regulating the... Um, the FinTech. The FinTech, yes. Keep them away. Yeah. So not just for us, the regulation, also those new bastards arriving, yes. <laughs> sure, by, by, by the way, they're all, and, and, and a lot of banks are trying to do that as well, absolutely. Okay, I think you've been quite... Uh, effective in identifying the key, uh, 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 let's say, avenues of the roadmap. So let's try and see what is happening in terms of how banks are reacting. But first, uh, let me just uh, highlight further the fact that uh, banks' position is really uncomfortable. Uh, uh, they, are really in the, uh, uh, they really run the risk of being the so-called uh, 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 boiled frog. No? The frog that is in a pot where every year the temperature raises a bit, so at the beginning you almost feel more comfortable than, than when you started, but then it keeps growing, growing, growing on every year a little bit to the point that you might really end up very, very badly and become something like the Kodak of, of this world. Uh, and where, as I said before, the financial markets are not helpful at all. Uh, uh, and it's amazing to see that, uh, uh, now we are in video, but there is a case of a bank that uh, in Europe uh, is seen very often as the benchmark bank for really doing all what looks like the right thing to do in terms of uh, 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 um, developing, uh, transforming digitally, uh, 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 doing venture capital investment, doing incubators, uh, transforming internally, uh, adopting new uh, uh, um, uh, uh, IT uh, uh, and digital skills, uh, that is completely neglected by the market. The market doesn't make a difference, and uh, you see, sometimes I was just for curiosity listening to uh, uh, um, um, analyst calls uh, of, uh, uh, in the presentation of results, nobody ever asked anything about uh, the digital strategy. I tell you my, from my experience, I was general manager in credit, I was meeting investor, and I tell you that whenever I was speaking about what we were doing in terms of digital transformation, 
they, 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 I was, uh, you know, uh, looked after like with a nice smile. I said, okay, fine, now a bit of break of not serious stuff. Now, now get back to business. Uh, how is your next quarter going to work? Uh, cost, revenues, cost of risk, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm uh, exaggerating a bit, but really to tell you the message that the financial markets investor is not helpful in the type of drive that you should be performing. So uh, one thing you didn't mention, and by, I put not by coincidence as number one of the avenues available is cost reduction. Um, if you think, and we started by saying that fintech and the new technology is, goes towards empowering the customer in a, in, a, in a big time and goes in the direction of reducing, mar reducing margins over time, it means that if you want to be sustainable, you must, in one way or the other, really think about a different cost curve. So you have to reduce costs. The, in the smart way, but you have to reduce costs. Um, and so, uh, uh, probably any, any consultant would agree and say that this is really the no regret moves in strategy, something that, uh, don't think about it, just do it. Uh, and this is going to uh, be through a, a, a reduction of the branch network over time, gradual. It can be through end-to-end uh, 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 -end process engineering, where you really, uh, um, uh, take out as much paper as possible from your processes, make it as digital as possible, and reduce the cost. It's a matter of automation. It's a matter of leveraging on the rec tech, I, I, I mentioned yesterday and before. It's a matter of simplifying the business model. That's something very, very relevant. I, I'll, I'll touch upon it uh, uh, also in the future, in a sense that uh, in this construction of these uh, big dinosaurs that banks are, there's enormous complexity enormous services uh, that are provided and for which customers are not paying. If you were in, uh, 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 in the retail activity and you would try and measure the equivalent of the SKUs, uh, you will see that the SKUs of banks are millions, really uh, to a point where it become unmanageable. Um, and you can reduce cost of risk through uh, the leverage uh, on data and real fintech and gives you uh, some nice hand uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, identifying uh, uh, fraud risk, uh, in terms of improving uh, uh, your overall uh, 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 your credit worthiness uh, 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 analysis of customer. So, uh, and on this one, you would probably hear uh, almost all bank CEOs agreeing that they have to reduce cost. And that's what you hear in all uh, analyst calls and in all in all type of situation. Not necessarily they will speak too much internally, because then it's difficult to motivate many, many people just by saying that you have to do cost reduction, but still is, uh, they are pretty well paid for, for uh, uh, managing these trade-offs. Second, uh, you, you said this, is venture capital investment. And uh, um, you, you can see that uh, probably two-thirds of the top uh, 40 world banks have set up uh, some kind of venture capital arm they are investing directly into fintech. Uh, they have been working to create incubators uh, with uh, two goals. One is to try and gain insight on what is happening, because you have a foot inside, you see a little bit the technology moving. And the second one is to make money. And maybe uh, you can be actually even uh, better than uh, a normal, uh, let's say, investor, because you know, you know the business. So uh, one can argue, and I think it's pretty right, that a bank uh, can more easily uh, spot those fintech uh, uh, ventures that have uh, good uh, opportunities, good probability to become a success versus the other. Um, one point of attention uh, of this strategy is that far from enough. And uh, what is happening uh, in many of these banks that have set up venture capital uh, funds is that it then uh, starts to exist a kind of strong separation between uh, those uh, uh, a bit funny, not tie high guy that go after venture capital, fintech, and so on, and those people who manage the banks. And sometimes I'll buy it to say, okay, this group is investing in many fintech, then nothing in terms of knowledge really spreads from one part of the bank to the other. So investing in itself uh, uh, is not enough unless you then create a very smart way to making sure that the knowledge you acquire there is really spread to the rest of the organization. Third, also this one was said, focused alliances. Uh, uh, alliances with fintech to do things together. Uh, here, 
An interesting analogy is the one with the pharma industry, where in the past, uh, most pharma companies would have a huge R&D department trying to identify and devising uh, the new uh, chemical principle to uh, uh, create a medicine for this, for that, and so on and so forth. At some point in time, they reduced that more and more and started instead to spend time scouting what were the best uh, uh, R&D centers in universities to identify uh, uh, ideas. So. Uh, um, that's something that banks can be doing also uh, in fintech, not necessarily investing, but much more to uh, understand exactly what is happening, identifying which one are the fintech to partner with, maybe to buy in the case. Um, uh, here, it's always good to have a clear strategy in mind. So if you do that, having clearly in mind that you not necessarily can keep being the one-stop shopping for any product, any customer, any service but you try to be more focused and specific on certain segments and uh, instrumentalize uh, uh, the FinTech Alliance for uh, creating uh, a, a really uh, uh, distinctive value proposition for that segment, that's likely to be much more successful. Um, uh, knowing that uh, 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 FinTech uh, in this context can provide you tools for developing uh, this kind of uh, mythical concept uh, that you often hear in fintech literature, which is a frictionless customer experience, which is a way uh, uh, for bankers uh, uh, to say that we would like to do like Amazon. We don't know how to do it, but we will create a friction frictionless customer experience. That's something that you often hear. Uh, as well as uh, to raise up uh, uh, digital sales. I said before, it's quite amazing. Still, most of the sales, vast majority of the sales do happen uh, through the branch and not. Uh, 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 digitally. Also, as a part of a focus alliance, you may think about enlarging the service, and yesterday we discussed uh, the impact of PSD2 open banking. Well, uh, that is an area. Again, uh, let's think about uh, uh, the bank as uh, uh, an Apple and uh, iOS uh, that host uh, a lot of application that can be a nice service for the customer. Why not thinking about the bank uh, becoming the equivalent uh, of uh, uh, Apple and the iOS, or if you say in the other world, uh, 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 Samsung and Google? Because <laughs> um, effectively, a lot of uh, 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 opportunities can be. Uh, and then there is the last uh, but not least, uh, which is really to say, OK, up to now we joked. Uh, what is happening is a real revolution. We want to rethink completely a business model, platform, and so on. Um, and uh, 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 that's something that, frankly, nobody has up to now really neither spelled out nor tried to attempt. Because it is difficult. <laughs> it is extremely difficult. Even if, uh, in theory, one could say that is the solution. Uh, 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 why and what should you do in order to uh, uh, pursue this avenue? Well, I, I start from the last. Uh, I spoke before about the core banking system. No? Uh, uh, co that is, as I said before, is very expensive, uh, uh, is old, uh, um, uh, it requires enormous time length to introduce innovation. Um, well, uh, everybody recognizes it's a problem. Uh, a number of banks have tried up to now mainly uh, to introduce uh, so-called uh, middleware layers, which are like layers that you put on top of what you have uh, uh, in order to uh, um, increase uh, uh, the effectiveness. Let me make an example, a concrete example. Um, in this old system, um, data can tra get transferred to bookkeeping in a batch way, so once a night. Uh, it means that the data depository gets updated also once a night, uh, once a day, effectively. Now, if you compare this with uh, the capability that, uh, let's say, I stay again in the airline uh, aggregator's world, no, of uh, somebody like Kayak that can price you differently based on what you did in the last 30 seconds and what you uh, searched for, so where you have really a continuous uh, adaptation, no, almost second by second of the approach, you can see that the difference is huge. No? So what have been banks doing since it's impossible with a core banking system to move to uh, real-time uh, uh, data? You uh, achieve real-time on a small piece. 
for instance, you uh, create uh, a special procedure for trading, where, for instance, that's necessary. You, know, you cannot in trading just update uh, once a day. No? And for that, you almost create a little environment in which it can happen no? uh, in a ring-fenced area, some kind of immediate reaction, but only for what is there. No? So, for instance, you cannot uh, know immediately how your current account has been impacted. You can just look at what is there. No? Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this middleware often goes in the direction uh, of uh, uh, almost screen scraping uh, on what is behind. Uh, sometimes what you have is somebody that is reading from the screen the data no? and is using them for a new application with the customer. No? So, uh, uh, this has been a, a road. Uh, it's much better than not doing anything, but uh, it's still a very expensive road. And uh, interesting enough, uh, um, uh, uh, 80% of what banks say they invest to improve their digital activity, in fact, uh, is uh, some kind of maintenance or evolution of the system. So, uh, uh, I said before, it's something very expensive, and the digital stuff is ma making it even more expensive instead of uh, helping uh, to be cheaper. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and a, a parallel problem, no, sorry, I, I arrived to that afterwards. I just uh, finished with la one last comment on AT because this is one of the big, big, big unsolved problems of banking today. What to do with your IT core banking system? Um, a few banks have thought, okay, now I don't care, I do it. I change the system. Well, changing the system is perceived, maybe tomorrow morning somebody will have the solution, but it's perceived like changing the engine of an airplane that is flying. In fact, uh, almost all big attempts failed. And where uh, clearly, uh, since you don't want the, the airplane to drop, no, in that context, you typically stop the wars after you have invested hundreds of millions of euros, dollars, whichever currency you want to think of. Uh, uh, and when you understand that uh, you're going the wrong direction, you prefer to stop uh, some cost and you keep going with the old system. Um, and in, uh, an interesting case is a case of another bank that uh, uh, has started to do something slightly different, which was uh, to create a new bank, uh, acquire a new IT system, completely modern, functional, open, and so on. And this bank uh, is, uh, is based in UK. It's thinking about having, in three, four years, a target bank and the target business model where they plan to migrate all the existing business from the old one. Uh, uh, it's easier, as always, you can imagine, to say than to make it, because part of the issue is that uh, the, new the new system is much cheaper, much more effective, but is much, much simpler. It means that when you want to make the change, you have to cut probably half of your products, half of your specialities, half of your SKUs. So it's a process that requires a major simplification of the business model. You must convince customers that they can uh, live also without the tiny stuff, etc. something that is coming from 30, 40 years of sedimentation. So you can see uh, the benefits of starting from scratch. If somebody could start from scratch and just get zillions of customers immediately, that would be the best. But that's difficult because customers are sticky. So that's part of uh, the problem why, uh, I said before, the solution is still a bit unclear. Now, open banking might also force some additional deep thoughts. Because uh, the moment in which uh, you go open yourself, you, know, you open the accounts of the customer, to many new app, many new producers, you have to, okay, but what is going to be my, my business? Fine, I can think theoretically that I want to be the Apple and the iOS uh, of the banking world, but again, nice concept, but then the implementation is not so obvious. Might require some deep thought about uh, your mission, your uh, target customer segments, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm almost at the end. In fact, uh, this is the last slide. I'm trying to be in time uh, to have uh, uh, um, at least 15 minutes of, of discussion. And where I just put some questions, I will comment very briefly because maybe we can discuss some of them. Um, so in this concept, uh, in, this, in this overall context, uh, uh, some other points are quite relevant. Uh, first of all is uh, cybersecurity. 
uh, I forgot to say that uh, these uh, uh, old core banking system do have one advantage. They are really secure. Uh, maybe because they are robust. Maybe because they are so complex that not even the most sophisticated hackers can try and find a way inside that. The fact is that uh, up to now, there are almost no cases uh, that core banking system have been truly violated. This is remarkable, if you think. Because, uh, uh, I mean, cyber risk uh, I mean, is something we all uh, think about something we don't want to be involved with, no? Because it can be a disaster. Core banking system, up to now, have uh, uh, been quite effective in avoiding hacking. So well, that's interesting. Then, question. How about the relation with economies of scale and scope in banking? Um, we've learned, and in the past uh, was clearly true, that uh, banks uh, uh, was a business of economies of scale, economies of scope, that the, the bigger you are, the better you are. Well, uh, you can put yourself a lot of questions now with fintech. Fintech are small. Uh, uh, the IT investments required to provide the same type of service on something specific is really a fraction of what the bank have to do with their core banking system. So uh, not necessarily is true anymore that being big uh, is, the, is the answer. Uh, I can tell you that in a country like Italy, the most innovative banks are not the top, one, top three banks, not even the top eight. Uh, the two best innovative banks are the number 12 and 15 in terms of size, because uh, size doesn't matter as much. Maybe scope matters. In one of the cases, the CEO is uh, a, a guy that could be the CEO of an internet company by way of birth. Uh, uh, his father was the shareholder and the CEO of the bank. He's become a CEO of a bank, and so he thinks about the bank uh, as if it was an internet company. So that, that makes a difference. But that's scope, not scale. Uh, uh, other thoughts. Will Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, at some point in time, enter into banking and wipe out everybody? That I think we can talk, and maybe uh, I'm happy, uh, I would really like to hear your viewpoints afterwards. Up to now, what one has been seeing is that mainly the, there has been inroads into banking, but mainly instrumental to the core business. So for instance, Apple Pay, that you know you use, if you look at the numbers and also the effort that Apple put into it, clearly it was not for Apple a way to gain a new business, but was much more a way to make this stuff uh, even more fundamental, even more important uh, uh, to hold, because it gives you also the possibility to pay. That's how the pricing of, and the alliance they made with banks uh, clearly shows. Or Amazon is lending money at zero rates. Again, uh, uh, the people of Amazon seem to think at this stage that for them it's not so important to make money on the lending, but to create loyalty with their own uh, customers. And the same is happening uh, with uh, Ant Financial uh, that we mentioned yesterday uh, um, in, uh, uh, in Alibaba, in Ant Financial in China. Uh, then uh, 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 we all know that uh, in the internet companies uh, to create uh, innovation you need uh, teamwork, uh, agile uh, approach, uh, scrum approach and so on, uh, which is almost the opposite of the way in which banks have been working up to now. Again, uh, if the financial market doesn't help, in a sense it's not pushing you to innovate, no? what is the role of the board? Uh, uh, would, it ch would it change to have in the board people who are really uh, uh, in knowledge of uh, the digital transformation, who might really push you in that direction, or is not so relevant? Last, story up to now has told banks that very, very often strategy could be copied easily. So, you could always have a brilliant strategy, but then the difference comes in, in execution. If that's true, uh, then probably, uh, uh, or one question is if also in this case, at some point somebody will find the right strategy, everybody will move, but then the winners will be those who execute successfully and not one, the first one who devised the idea. So this was just to leave you some, some questions about this topic. And as I said before, uh, uh, um, there's, no, there's no clear happy ending. No? It might be that the banks got extinct, it might be they find a solution and we keep thriving uh, uh, quite successfully. But I'm sure that uh, 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 you have some comments, a question, and so on. That was the last of my slides. Who wants to? Please. Uh, yeah, you were absolutely sure. Uh, thank you, Roberto. This is really useful. Um, yesterday, you talked about kayak.com. You talked about banks as a service. So my question, again, sorry, yeah. you, you talked about Kayak.com as a data yes, aggregator yeah. and even yeah, the BAAS, yeah, yeah. Banks as a Service. How this, my question was, how does 
you know, customer stickiness almost now play a part because if I'm a bank and there's now my bank is commoditized, it's a pure service. People just want kind of cheapest, fastest service. How do I think about customer retention and stickiness? Uh, absolutely. It's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, and uh, uh, by talking about uh, bank as a service, yes, uh, uh, somebody of you uh, uh, highlighted to me that I should have mentioned a very interesting case of a new bank uh, called Monzo uh, uh, in UK. Monzo has managed to achieve close to one million customers in uh, one year and a half, which is absolutely remarkable. Um, these customers have not closed their account. They added a Monzo account, but the Monzo is more a wallet rather than a current account. Uh, and Monzo uh, uh, is a bank that effectively is based on a, 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 a bank as a service. Uh, 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 no, sorry. Uh, Monzo has created its own uh, uh, core banking system. Um, and is providing uh, uh, quite an effective uh, uh, way to, to bank in terms of current account. Um, now, probably the service that Monzo provides is not yet something that uh, is really uh, so uh, uh, crucial, uh, so fundamental for the customer that uh, uh, he can be happy then to close everything else and just stick with Monzo. Uh, one has to see if uh, 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 probably Monzo will have to add more services. There's a need of a bit of time because if you put yourself into the customer's shoes, uh, um, when it comes to current account management, clearly you want to pay, uh, you want to pay as little as possible, but you also to want to make sure that uh, uh, the service is effective, that if you have uh, a problem, uh, the troubleshooting works quickly. Uh, uh, so not necessarily uh, a change of a bank that is ultimately is a long-term relationship is something you do it overnight. Uh, uh, however, it goes in the direction of potentially addressing uh, and changing uh, the matter regarding uh, customer stickiness. I hope uh, this answered your question. Please. Um, my question is, if you have one million to invest, how will you allocate your budget between traditional bank and the FinTech? And second question is, will your decision different if you have 10 billion? 10 billion, yeah. 1 million, okay? <laughs> Now, uh, I think that the difference is also short-term versus medium-term. Huh? Um, honestly, one million it starts to be already quite a lot of money. Uh, uh, let me say that uh, um, my answer is that I would put a lot of money into uh, B2B fintech. Uh, because those fintech that are uh, today uh, providing uh, uh, an option for banks to reduce a lot their cost are no-brainers. If uh, they devise a, a smart solution, banks will buy it, and that will immediately create uh, a, a return for those. So in my view, the things to, 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 to focus on is a, a, a business to business fintech. Anyway, there's, inter there's an interesting uh, fund that I created in New York that has started to, to, uh, uh, to invest uh, in being focused uh, exactly, exactly on this area. Um, so, uh, you know, Short term is relevant. I think your question was much more for the long term. And the longer term, uh, I, unlike the markets, I would probably reward those banks that are proving today to be more daring in terms of changing the business model. I think that since execution is uh, 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 the keyword, uh, and I also see, uh, since this is a, a new ground, I tend to believe that those ones who started earlier and made mistakes earlier could be more effective later on in finding the right solution. So uh, uh, I will go against the market on this one. Please. I would like to circle back to our discussion about lobbying. Yeah. Is it that banks don't recognize the threats of fintech, or is it, and that's why they don't invest in lobbying? You know, what what are the efforts of the incumbents essentially? Uh, in uh, uh, my understanding, uh, 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 they have invested and been not too successful in Europe and UK. Uh, so the new regulation introduced uh, uh, are uh, uh, very good for fintech and uh, are very, very good for customers. And uh, there's still a, a question mark, big question mark for the existing incumbents. Uh, I'm less familiar with US, 
I can see that, however, uh, they prevented this regulation to be introduced. So I don't know if they lobbied or not, <laughs> but clearly uh, the situation today is better for uh, incumbent banks in the States than it is in Europe. Thanks so much for the presentation. My question is, uh, how, do, how do you think of FITAC as, uh, as an interaction with shadow banking? And also, uh, do you, what's your opinion on maybe like uh, decades, decades later, uh, the government area uh, began to step in and get more regulation mm -hmm. on those areas? Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, again, I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a very good question. Um, in fact, uh, there is a piece of, uh, uh, um, of fintech that very, very clearly uh, is uh, based on uh, regulatory arbitrage, uh, which is uh, marketplace lending. In fact, uh, in the case of marketplace lending, uh, the lending club, uh, lending circle, and so on of this world uh, effectively uh, uh, managed to uh, uh, channel uh, non-capital required funds, uh, shadow economy type, but asset management funds, uh, directly into uh, borrowing uh, uh, needs. Uh, so in that case, uh, clearly, uh, the fact of not having capital requirements uh, make the entire fintech proposition more effective. Um, and uh, uh, at some point in time, I might also raise some question if that creates or not uh, also some kind of new systemic risk. Uh, in theory, uh, in the institutional investors, there is uh, uh, enough sophistication to decide uh, if to choose uh, a certain platform or another and to, uh, um, let's say, decide uh, what kind of a portfolio allocation to give. It's interesting from this standpoint that uh, there are some aspects of industry that are a little bit uh, self-adjusting. You remember that some years ago, everybody was talking about peer-to-peer -peer lending, no? And the story was that uh, 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 you and me would be uh, lending money to the shopkeeper down the shop. This is not happening. In reality, what is happening is that the marketplace platform is identifying if to uh, lend money to this shopkeeper or the other. But on the back, there is not a depositor, individual depositor. Right now, on the back, there are institutional investors. So. Uh, there is also, uh, how can I say, a, a, a positive, I would say, self-adjusting pattern in the development of fintech. So you talk about uh, how you think uh, fintech can potentially affect retail banking and private wealth management in the future. So can you share with us your insight about how you think fintech can affect uh, investment banking in the future as well? Thanks. Uh, I must admit that while I started my career in investment banking, I then focused a lot on retail. So uh, uh, my answer will be much more superficial. Uh, and uh, I, I will say something that uh, I'm sure you read uh, almost everywhere. Uh, as far as investment banking is concerned uh, and wholesale banking in general, uh, there is a lot of hope uh, that is put in the potential of the blockchain. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, 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 transactions do require today in the global uh, wholesale and commercial banking activity enormous costs uh, being required uh, to uh, confirm transactions, to ensure clearing, uh, to ensure the completion and safety of payments. Uh, it's really a, a, a not negligible part of the entire cost of the uh, financial intermediation channel. And uh, uh, people believe that potentially the new technology implied in blockchain as a way to verify payments uh, uh, could really help a, a substantial reduction of this cost. That's uh, uh, definitely one of the areas in which uh, 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 the wholesale world uh, uh, could receive a major impact. Now, a uh, um, lot of people are also devising and working on uh, a, a artificial intelligence uh, application, for instance, in the, ter in, the, in the interpretation of financial markets. Since markets are based on psychology, one could argue that uh, AI uh, could help uh, in identifying better the pattern of movement in the market. Uh, however, also, and uh, actually, some hedge funds claim that they found uh, uh, the magic graal solution in terms of uh, uh, better than others in spotting uh, uh, market inconsistencies and making money on that. Uh, beyond that, I don't feel comfortable to continue. I know some other things, but not so relevant and not so confident. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about the 
differences of or the organizational setting and the internal operating model needed uh, for, for banks to foster this kind of innovation? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, um, I think uh, uh, that's also an important question because I spoke more of the problems and you say what can be the solutions. Um, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, in my view, a solution uh, uh, could come, uh, first of all, from uh, raising uh, at all level of the bank in a major way the awareness that the current model are not sustainable. Even if the market doesn't ask you anything and the market is just asking you the quarterly results, I believe that uh, if people like uh, uh, you uh, uh, will be working in banks at all level, irrespective of what the market is asking, you will be inclined to try and push the bank towards uh, uh, innovating, transforming, and getting more digital. So first aspect is uh, probably to work on the culture um, at all levels. Uh, it means uh, 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 in, the, in the operational level, in the managerial levels, but also in the board. Because again, uh, 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 what you need here is to do important investment, also risk investment. Often a CEO could be in the position to say, now, uh, uh, if I change the core banking system, think about it. It's a three to five years project. It might call, cost me from 300 million to $1 billion. Uh, I will bear, bear all the cost and the risk. And uh, since uh, CEOs change every five, six years, uh, all the benefits will be taken by somebody afterwards. I may still want to do it, but at least would like to have the board that is completely coherent and compact behind me. No? So also the board position in terms of uh, digital, uh, so uh, uh, culture is, in my view, uh, um, uh, 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 how can I say, the, 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 yeah, uh, uh, the understanding of digital, how much people feel committed and compelled to move uh, is the number one thing. Second, uh, 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 it's very important within the bank uh, to try and create uh, 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 a more team-oriented culture. Uh, again, it might be a matter of the way in which uh, the uh, uh, MBO systems are built. It's a matter of having the right people in the right position. Uh, there are people that are fantastic professionals, but they just want to be lone wolf. And, long, and being lone wolf doesn't work at all. Typically, it doesn't work in many, many things. Here is a killer. Um, and uh, 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 might require sometimes to uh, uh, take uh, some experiments. Uh, like the one I mentioned before, I find it uh, quite attractive, trying to create a new bank. Uh, uh, starting and aiming it to become the new target system to then migrate the business is something I could seriously consider to try and address uh, 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 some, of the, some of these constraints. Uh, but definitely, um, the big challenge is to move from a hierarchical silos organization, to answer your point, uh, to something that is much more horizontal and where uh, behaviors uh, uh, oriented towards uh, team playing uh, are rewarded uh, even more than uh, uh, lonely wolf behavior that can be successful, but that create a problem for everybody else in the organization. Thank you, Roberto. Um, I have a question about what you think of the idea of, um, for lack of a better word, going down with a ship. So on the Kodak analogy, um, you know, they had an you know, existing technology that was very value creative to their shareholders, but the new technology coming forward, people didn't necessarily care about which you know, RAM or which memory sticks they used and put into their digital cameras, um, whereas their advantage was in the film. So to the extent that the banks have a lot of value added services and there's a spectrum of stickiness between um, you know, things that are more commoditized, um, such as you know, perhaps payments that are being disrupted today, to things that are a little bit more sticky. What do you think about the idea of sort of um, buttoning down the hatches on the so um, buttoning down the hatches on the more uh, uh, on the more defendable portions of a bank that are higher touch um, as a strategy? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, 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 there's again a lot of sense uh, because. Uh, 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 what, you are, what you are saying uh, 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 reflects very much the, the basic concept of uh, uh, do what you're good at. And uh, uh, clearly, there are, for those segments, private banking is an example, no? uh, uh, where uh, human touch is fundamental, clearly is much more defendable than uh, 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 many are, uh, other areas of the business. Um, within this frame, a potential answer, by the way, something on which many banks are investing, uh, 
uh, stays in the fact that uh, if uh, uh, customers have not, in fact, yet really decided that they want to completely drop a channel and uh, embrace completely another one, so drop completely the branch and, and use only uh, uh, the smartphone, uh, but customers, uh, m most customers, are still in a position where they would like to uh, use the branch when there's a specific need of the branch. Uh, the smartphone uh, in another moment, uh, and maybe later the Apple Pay or, or Internet Banking for something else, uh, then uh, there is a, a, a specific, uh, that is a quintessential banking competence, which is multi-channel delivery. Uh, where, for instance, uh, uh, um, the capability to making sure that you start a transaction on a smartphone, but then there is uh, something complicated and you prefer to immediately talk to somebody and maybe just find here the possibility to talk to a call center. No? And then maybe there is an, an aspect that you prefer to discuss in person and go to the branch. So this type of uh, mixture of uh, delivery is something that only the bank can, can deliver. If you think a fintech cannot do it simply because they don't have uh, uh, yet uh, uh, the branch network, the physical aspect, and so on. So, for those customers for which multi channel is important, they are natural customers for the banks to go. So, I think that, uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what you said can provide part of the answer. Uh, 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 banks uh, uh, today have to uh, consider uh, thoroughly. Uh, which are the uh, customer segment, which are the specific needs, uh, on which their position is structurally potentially superior than the one of FinTech, and then those one trying to be the best. Having in mind that uh, uh, the, the clock is ticking, and these things are changing. So also the multi-channel stuff I just mentioned, and maybe five years from now, will be less relevant than today. Uh, but definitely, uh, as in many other businesses, being aware about your real interior strength for the customer instead where you're weak uh, should be the starting point for any strategy. I'm with you. I think that we are more or less uh, at the end of this uh, last question. If not, uh, if not, uh, uh, we just finish. Thanks very much. Thank you. Here we go.